One of the ideas that we've tried to continue to present on the show for more than four years now is that Star Wars is best when it's viewed through the eyes of children. A few months ago, I was scrolling through Twitter when I saw someone tweeting about how they were experiencing the same thing while watching Star Wars Rebels. That someone was none other than Star Wars author Kevin Scott. He's with me on today's show to discuss this and a lot more. This is Tatooine Sons. It's true. It's true. All of it. What is the name of the Porg on the Millennium Falcon? Force is strong in my family. What do you think his name is? <laughs> it's a big moment. I am a Jedi, like my father before me. Maybe Turbis? Do or do not. There is no try. Turbis? <laughs> Pablo, if you're listening to this live stream, that pork's name is now Turbis. It's a good Star Wars name. We're not done yet. These guys recorded an awesome podcast called Tatooine Sons. Everybody was lit. Welcome to Tatooine Sons, the only fan podcast to name an official Star Wars creature and to be endorsed by the writer-director of The Last Jedi, Ryan Johnson. We believe that pop culture is the mythology of this generation, that there is a story, it is written on our souls, and that these myths speak to that story. And that is why I am so honored to be joined today by Kevin Scott. Kevin Scott is a New York Times bestselling author whose work includes novels, television, comic books, and award-winning audio dramas. He's written for a large number of high-profile series, including Star Wars, Batman, Doctor Who, Assassin's Creed, Pacific Rim, Transformers, Back to the Future, Star Trek, Vikings, Adventure Time, and more. His latest creator-owned comic book series, the supernatural urban fantasy Shadow Service, launched in 2020 from Vault Comics. And Kevin's stories are some of the most interesting in the Star Wars universe. He pushes the envelope and he ventures into some of the more creepy and mystical elements of the galaxy far, far away. But no matter how crazy his stories get, they always feel like Star Wars. I asked Kevin what he thinks makes a Star Wars story work. I think adventure, first and foremost. Um, adventure's built into Star Wars. It's built into its bones. Um, from George's original inspirations of the you know the the serials science fiction serials that he, he adored yeah it's just there it has to be in it, 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 its heart it's adventure it's dare and do it's excitement um but beyond that it's character i mean like any story character you know we wouldn't care about the adventure if we didn't care about the characters and the one thing we've seen time and time again in star wars is that we care about these characters they care about each other um and we latch on to that those relationships whether that's a relationship between friends right. family right. or enemies um it's something it's something we all recognize in ourselves and we we love to see on screen or or in the written word or in comics um and i mean yeah that's that's the heart adventure and character that's what makes star wars star wars which character has been your favorite to write <sighs> it's so hard it's so <laughs> it's like so asking hard you which one of your children is their fav your favorite right <laughs> yeah i mean i mean People who know what I've been doing for the last couple of years would know right. that Jackson's going to be mentioned sooner or later. Um, Jackson, <laughs> the, if you don't know Jackson, he's a green furred space rabbit um, who originally appeared in the Marvel comics of the late seventies and early eighties. Um, he was my first experience of star Wars. Um, the first thing I ever encountered with star Wars was an issue of star Wars weekly, which we had over here in the UK, which reprinted the original Marvel run. Jackson was in that first issue. I loved him from that point on before I realized that you weren't supposed to love him. Um, and so when the opportunity came to bring him back and recanonize him, I have, and what's been the joy is that people have really taken him to their hearts and um 
And I think he sums up a lot of what I love about Star Wars. You know, he's not a Jedi by any means. He's not a, he's not competent by any means half the time, <laughs> but he really cares. And um, he cares about how people look at him, how he comes across. And we've been able to tell some great stories. So yeah, D- Jackson's right up there. Away from Jackson, I suppose more recently, um, it's been the story of Keeve and Skier in the mm-hmm. High Republic comic book from Marvel mm-hmm. Comics. Um, Keeve was the first character I came up with for the High Republic. She's been very personal to me. Um, and see, so, yeah, I've loved telling her story, which I can't believe at the minute. Well, it's not ending um, this week but as we talk. Um, mm-hmm. It's pausing as we come to the end of the first phase of the High Republic. Um, and in a lot of ways, this has only been the beginning of her story and it, we've got a long way to go. It's awesome. So you mentioned High Republic. Obviously, mm. um, that's been uh, taken up a huge part of your life uh, for all the way back since uh, it was announced as kind of Project Luminous and even before that in 2018. Mm. What's it been like uh, crafting such an epic story with so many of these other talented storytellers um, uh, You know, across such a, a massive um, endeavor? What's that been like for you? It's been incredible. It's been challenging in ways we never thought it would hmm. be so when we talked last obviously i knew what was going on right. behind the scenes and um and we'd started to plan and we started to write and then we were all set to launch and then the pandemic happened and hmm. caused all kinds of chaos for so many people in so many ways and and the way one of the ways it manifested for us is that we had to change our plans and so the plans to create this new corner of star wars um you know, primarily, especially for publishing, um, went to awry a bit when we realized we wouldn't be able to see each other every few months, which was always the plan. So we had to adapt to working remotely as everyone has. Um, and in some ways, I think that helped. It helped, it helped us take a bit of time because we suddenly had a, a, a the, the launch was pushed back so we could rethink and we could, we could work out what else we could do within the era. And it, it gave us chance to write more stories actually um rather than less Mm. and also as we came used to writing and speaking to each other digitally and on zoom and and in groups and things like that um we actually became a lot closer and and so in a way we ended up working closer than i think we would have done if we had only been meeting every few months in person as the original plan was as a you know when it comes to telling that story and you know we're we're through the first phase of it as i've said now um it's been remarkable to see people take it to their hearts because you say i've been working on this since 2018 um people have only really known these characters for a year and it's Mm -hmm. been incredible to see how much they they have welcomed them and how they've become um so invested in their stories um more so than i think any of us ever thought would happen um and that's that's been exciting because it has led more people, you know, higher up in Lucasfilm and Disney to take notice and more things are happening because of that. And, you know, we're now entering a much bigger time for the High Republic, bigger than we even planned because of the response from people um, and because of the positivity that surrounds that part of fandom. Um, because it has been a little oasis in Star Wars fandom as well. It's been a, a, a period a, a place online where people are encouraging each other when they're being massively creative. Um, we, you know, we're seeing lots of art, lots of, um, lots of fan fiction, which I'm fortunate I can't read because of legal reason that that sucks. Um, lots of cosplay. I mean, the first convention I went to after the pandemic, I walked into the main hall and found someone cosplaying as, as Ava Chris, which was incredible oh, wow. to see. It was, it was just amazing. I sent some pictures straight back to the, the other guys and went, look, um, and yeah, so that response really has opened the doors to so much more for the High Republic. Um, and it's growing. I mean, last week or the week before, I don't know. I'm still a bit dazed and confused. <laughs> I was out in Florida for our, yeah. our, our first writers, um, summit since the pandemic. Um, and it was so good to be able to sit in a room, a big room when they could put lots of space between us if we wanted it, not because we don't get on, but because of COVID restrictions. Right. Um, and, it was so we were planning then the third the third phase of the high republic um which we knew how the third phase was ending we knew how this story was going for all these characters it was a chance this, this summit was a chance to sit together and really nail those storylines and worked out if all our plans still held true which they did but again they've got bigger um and so you know this is five years of storytelling um 
that is really only the beginning of a, of a story for so many of these characters. So, yeah, it's been surprising, it's been challenging, but it's been so, so rewarding. It's such a vast uh, story. There's so many different uh, books and comic books and everything that's going on with it. And who knows what else could be coming in the future um, as it, it's gained popularity, like you're saying. Uh, for for those of us who um, have not been all in on the High Republic from the beginning, not because we didn't love what we got into, but because of just Because time. there's so much. Yeah, there's just so much of it. Yeah. How would you recommend uh, a newbie that's a Star Wars fan, uh, but a newbie to the High Republic, how would you recommend them sort of engage with these stories and kind of start? Where would you recommend them, you know, begin this process? Well, one of the things we we tried to plan into it when we were designing the story is that we were working on different formats and we very purposely did that. So if you're a fan of the comics, you can jump into the Marvel comic or the all age comic that are published by IDW and now are moving over to Dark Horse. If you are a fan of the adult novels, Delray novels, you could start with Light of the Jedi. We had the YA novels, we had the middle grade novels. Um, and at, at that point, that's all we had. Now we have a lot more. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, those were designed and they still are jumping on points. You know, yes, there will be things happening in the other formats. Um, and obviously our hope is that over time you will go and pick those up and get the whole picture. But we understand, we get, it's a lot. And it's been a lot in a very short space of time. And that's something, you know, we've been thinking about as, as we've been seeing the reactions as we, we've been telling the story, you know, it's a it's an evolving process of how we're going to be telling these stories and how we're going to be pushing the publishing forward. Um, but all of those first publications that came out last January, mm -hmm. last year, are a really good place to jump on because they should, if we've done our job correctly, be able to be read independently. Okay. Um, and so if you love comics, yeah, please do pick up my Marvel series, um, um, The High Republic. If you like comics, but perhaps you're coming from a family point of view, or you just, you know, you want a, a story with younger characters, then Daniel's All Age Comics for you. So, you know, similarly with Claudia's first YA, Justina's first middle grade, and Charles's first novel. I mean, Light of the Jedi does kick everything off in a way. Oh, right. So I think that's the, the best primer you could have. Um, but don't feel you have to keep up. That's the one thing I would say to everyone. And, you know, don't enjoy the High Republic. You know, enjoy the High Republic. Don't punish yourself with the High Republic, right. you know. Um, I see this a lot, and I, I understand it as well. You know, um, there's a lot of Star Wars. It's just in the same way there's a lot of the MCU now. There's a lot right. of comics out there. Um, you can't read everything. You have lives you must live those lives and use this as part of your life. So do it at your own pace. These comics, these books aren't going anywhere, no matter what certain people say online. They're here to stay. <laughs> so you can read them at exactly your own rate. Now, that does give the problem with spoilers. And let's face it, we all live in the world where spoilers are, are a thing. And right. there's not much we can do about that. Um, but, yeah, you, you haven't got to worry about keeping up to date. We have now also got a handy pause um, between now and October when the second phase is launched which means you can go back and read the things you missed or just take it a bit slower um, perhaps filling in some of the gaps from the other ranges things that perhaps you wouldn't usually try but yeah I mean that's probably the biggest thing I say all the time to people is like read it at your own rate you know enjoy this savour it don't feel you have to read everything as it comes because as I said these books aren't going off the shelves they're going to be there you'll be able to find them so so yeah it's um I think hopefully if you read everything or read as much as you can you will get a wider sense of what the story is but again we've tried really hard to make it that if you just want to follow that one path it should um, give you a full story that you'll be able to enjoy When the High Republic was first announced and then released, Sam, Nate, and I were very excited. We had every intention of devouring every piece of the story as soon as we could. But then life got in the way. Uh, we made the decision to move from Florida to Alabama, and everything turned on its head. And we've read a few of the stories when we could, 
but then we quickly fell behind and honestly got a little discouraged and overwhelmed by it all. We're really excited uh, to take some time during this pause to re-engage with the High Republic and the stories that so many of you have come to love. I want to take just a moment to encourage you to check out this episode's sponsor, The Hero's Journal. Uh, We've begun a quest to better ourselves and our lives through this amazing tool that uses the power of stories and scientifically proven productivity techniques to help fans like us take control of the story that we tell ourselves. Changing our story takes small changes over a period of time. It's not giant moments of inspiration. It's the small, continuous, consistent actions And the Hero's Journal provides a fun and powerful way of taking those steps. Now, over the next few weeks, we're going to be taking a lot uh, more steps and we're going to be talking a lot more about the Hero's Journal. But if you want to take your first steps now, go and check out theheroesjournal.co to learn more. That's theheroesjournal.co. Kevin was uh, first on our show all the way back in April of 2019 when we interviewed him at Star Wars Celebration regarding Dooku Jedi Lost. Now, since then, he's done probably hundreds of interviews on podcasts about that story and all of his work in the High Republic. But I wanted to have him back on when I read a tweet he shared about watching Star Wars Rebels with his daughters. I asked Kevin what it's like seeing Star Wars through the eyes of his kids. Yeah, so I've been reading Star Wars since 79, and um, Empire was the first film I saw. Mm-hmm. saw Star Wars actually after that. Um, when I had my kids, I got two daughters, Chloe and Connie. I desperately tried to indoctrinate them into the realm <laughs> of Star Wars, and it failed just about every time. It was like, stop putting that film on, Dad. Um, and then the glorious day happened when I was in the kitchen, and one of them came running out and said, Come to this look at the telly, Daddy. And I walked in there, and they said, "Is this that Star Wars thing you keep trying mm. to get us to watch?" And it was Rebels. Oh, wow. And I, at that point, I was just starting. I think was it before? I, I think it might have been just before I started to work on Star Wars. And so, I think I, I was aware of Rebels, but I hadn't seen it. And so, I looked at it for a minute and went, "Yes, this is the most Star Wars thing I've seen in years." And we sat down and we watched. I think it was episode two or something. And we went back and watched the the first episode. And then it became part of our week. You know, the girls absolutely discovered it for themselves. Um, and we sat down every week and we watched Rebels together. And from Rebels, we went and watched the original trilogy. And they would finally watch Star Wars. And then we watched. Um, the prequels and then they were just at the right age for the force awakens to hit and for ray to hit and whatever you think about ray and i know a lot of people have very strong opinions sure for my girls she was a hero and is a hero to this day so last week um in florida i sent a picture of you know the 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 cast member playing ray in (laughs) batu and now my daughter's you know my eldest daughter's nearly 15, my youngest is 13, and they still got excited uh, about Ray as I get excited about Luke and Han. Yeah. You know, for for them, she is their hero, um, mm-hmm. and she probably always will be, you know. And so I saw those sequel films through their eyes completely. And when we get to Rise of the Sky, a race of Skywalker, and yeah, there's, there's things, as a storyteller, I'm going, perhaps I wouldn't go that way. Mm-hmm. It was an experience watching it because they were besides themselves watching that film. My youngest is a massive Chewy fan. So there was okay. one point when I thought we had to leave the theater because she was inconsolable. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thankfully, JJ didn't make, it, make us wait too long. <laughs> and so we could see the end of it. But yeah, so my relationship with those films is wrapped up in my kids in a way that I didn't have with the prequels, which is why my relationship with the prequels at the time was quite complicated. Yeah. Um, and, and likewise, the Clone Wars helped me come to terms as an original trilogy fan with, um, and also a Dark Horse comics fan mm. with the, you know, with the, the way the prequels were working. Um, but again, we work back. We, you know, they, they fell in love with Ahsoka because of Rebels. And then when we went back and I rewatched parts of Clone Wars and saw parts of Clone Wars I hadn't seen, Ahsoka's story meant so much more to me as well. Mm-hmm. So 
Yeah, at the end of the day, these films were made for families. These, this entire franchise was made for families. So for me, it's vitally important. And when I started to write Star Wars, and when I started to write a lot more within the all-age family bracket of Star Wars as well, I've moved a little bit out of that more recently, but that's where I started in Star Wars. Right. They were my focus group. They were the people I could come in and say, right, I'm going to get Han and Chewie doing this. What do you think? And they were going, that's rubbish, Dad, don't do that. They, they'd never act like that. Or they'd suggest <laughs> something that I realized I'm going to have to pay them royalties for, which because it was brilliant. And so... Yeah, they they were the people I went to um, every day to say, I'm doing this in Star Wars. And their excitement of the fact I was doing it led in to my excitement to keep, you know, do it as well. And so a lot of um, my passion for Star Wars, which has always been there, was rekindled through seeing it as a family. And it's now, you can't escape it in this house, but it's, you know, and I, I, I never want that to change. <laughs> it's really interesting because that's exactly the same uh, progression um, and experience that we had here. Mm. You know, I couldn't get the boys to watch Star Wars for the life of them when it comes to the original six movies. But when they got engaged in Rebels, they became massive Star Wars fans. And that's what yeah. led to this this podcast with it. Um, in fact, so much so, much so that... Uh, at the end of season two of The Mandalorian, that final uh, episode of season yeah. two, when Luke Skywalker is coming in and you're not 100% sure it's Luke, all of the original trilogy fans are convinced it's Luke. And as yeah, I'm yeah. watching it, I'm convinced it's Luke. My youngest son was just begging for it to be Ezra Bridger that yeah. was showing up at that point. And it really helped me understand how different... Uh, you know, our experiences with Star Wars are because of the eras that we grow up in yeah, and how exactly Edward that. Bridger is his Luke Skywalker. Just, you know, yeah. you know, it's just a, it's a different approach with that. That's exactly. awesome. And, you know, and that's the something I had to come to terms with, with the prequels. And I say because of my kids and because of the Clone Wars and actually, yeah, absolutely. Because of my kids, because my kids love the prequels as well. You know, they, they love um, the Phantom Menace. And for me as a fan going into that, I was one of those that came out and went, really? Um, <laughs> and they've completely turned that on its head now. And mm. so it's, it's become an era that while I appreciated before as a filmmaking experience and it was beautiful and it was so well done, I always said it wasn't for me. Mm. I don't think it was for me as a, as the fan I was then it definitely, I needed to become a father to be mm -hmm. to be a fan of that movie because I needed to experience it with my kids. Um so now when I go back and watch those movies, it's a completely different experience, even if they're not there. And I the fact I even put them on, not for work, um, and not because they're there, <laughs> is a massive change in my life. Um, because you know, and my kids have changed me in so many ways other than Star Wars. Sure. But you know, it's something I would never have done um as a star wars fan so yeah they've they've changed my entire view on what makes star wars and, and why we should be excited about it that's awesome you know one niche that you've really explored in star wars as you've uh, becoming involved in writing from it in, in lots of different uh, areas even outside of the high republic um has been scary star hmm. wars uh stories uh what do you like about the horror genre uh, and uh, bringing those stories into a galaxy far far away at the end of the day, I am a horror fan, and I have been a horror fan uh, for a very, very long time. Star Wars is part of that. Idea. Star Wars has monsters, and you get mm -hmm. to, you know Jabba's um, Jabba's palace in Return of the Jedi, um, and you get the Rancor, and you get the Sarlacc pit, and you get you get just about everything. And um, and you look at like Empire Strikes Back, and that the introduction of the um, on Hoth when you know in the cave with when Luke's hanging upside down, that's terrifying, especially yeah. in the original cut when you don't actually see the creature, you know, it was a, it's, um, it's monsters were always there. I was also the other thing growing up in the seventies in, in Britain, I was a doctor who fan and yeah. getting doctor who fan is all about scaring kids silly with monsters. Yeah. And so the combination of the two led me to hammer horror and universal and, and, and the eighties horror films as well. So it became, yeah, it's totally baked into me. Um, and what I like about, I mean, I like being scared. That sounds a crazy thing to say, but I think we, it's the same thrill you get from a roller coaster, you know, and I think for people watching horror films, I think why horror films are important, um, and important for kids as well is that it's a safe training ground for life on how to handle fear. Um, mm. because fear is such a part of us. We know it leads to the dark side. Yes, Yoda. We know that. Mm -hmm. Um, but we do have to cope 
cope with it and deal with it, which is one of the main themes of Star Wars The High Republic is how, you know, the question I asked right at the beginning of that was, what do the Jedi fear? Because I wanted to know how they would cope with it if they if they faced it. Um, and yeah, I think horror films are a great way to face that fear on your own terms when you can turn off or you can close the page on a Stephen King novel. Um, Neil Gaiman always says that the horror writers he knows are some of the most balanced people in the universe because all their dark side is trapped in books. Um, <laughs> and I think there's a lot to be said for that. You know, um, I realize horror is not for everyone. And when I do write horror within Star Wars, I, I, I try to um, be responsible as I can. Obviously I've written horror for all ages and then right. in a comic for the High Republic. Um, and probably in the rising storm, I pushed it into a more adult, realm as well um but again it still has to be horror in star wars it can't just become a splatter fest in star wars you know it has to maintain the the general concepts of what makes star wars star wars and hope being at the center center of that and again hope is a big part of horror um joe hill recently said in an interview in fangoria that hope is central to horror because and I've, i'm going to be misquoting him here and i apologize mm-hmm. um you have to hope that your the people you're watching will get out of the situation. And sometimes they will, but the majority of the time they won't. But that's why you keep watching, because you always hope they're going to escape. Um, and then sometimes you hope that the baddies will come back as they do <laughs> regularly. But, um, you know, that hope is obviously so central to Star Wars. And so in a way, horror in Star Wars is given a little bit of a safety net because you know at the end of the day that there is always hope. And that's mm-hmm. what I've tried to do in the horror I've written within the galaxy far, far away. That's interesting because one of the questions that we always want to ask uh, someone when we have them on this interview series, we close out the interview with it, is for you, how does Star Wars inspire hope? So mm. uh, it leads right into that. Uh, how would you answer that question? I think it is the fact that for me a lot of the storytelling i think that is central to star wars is the idea that if you work together good things will happen and when you're apart that's when things start going wrong um it's what i'm constantly saying in the writer's room for the high republic is like why aren't these characters talking together and probably we should make them because let's face it star wars would have been a lot shorter if people had talked to each other <laughs> um and that's what for me is one of the constant themes of the prequels all the way through is that you know anakin if you just talk to obi-wan and if obi-wan you'd actually listened well there is no darth vader um and so for me it, again it's the hope that when you come together um and you, and we talk a lot about found family and, you know, real family as well um, in in Star Wars. It's the hope of those people coming together and doing something that's greater than they could on their own. Um, and I think that's um, something, especially at the minute, that we all need to hear over and over and over again. The phenomenon that is Star Wars is really about millions and millions of people coming together around something they love. People from different countries and different religions and different economic statuses, different belief systems, and countless other differences. What brings them together is their love for these amazing stories. And I can't help but remember sitting in the panel where Project Luminous was announced at Star Wars Celebration Chicago. As we waited for that panel to begin, there were some fans that were sitting behind us as we were uh, waiting for it. And they were talking about all these reasons that they hated The Last Jedi. Of course, we have a very different opinion on that film, as you all know. So we turned around and we actually began discussing this with them. They shared their thoughts. We shared ours. It was kind. It was civil. It was even helpful to hear their perspective. And so along with Kevin, I hope that we can find more ways to build communication with each other around Star Wars in the future. I want to thank Kevin Scott for joining me on this week's interview show. Kevin's website is the best place to go for all the news about the things he's working on. It's www.kevinscott.com. That's two T's at the end of Scott. And be sure to follow at Kevin Scott on Twitter. 
Uh, phase one of Star Wars The High Republic reaches its galaxy-shaking conclusion in Star Wars The High Republic. It's written by Kevin. Um, it's that comic. It's out. It came out the beginning of March, and uh, the story sounds amazing. Only one person can save the Jedi from the mysterious monsters that stalk Starlight Beacon. Who will live and who will die? Be sure to grab your copy of that. If you're a DC Comics fan like BB Nate, you're going to want to check out Kevin's work on Titans United. Uh, his run with that series finishes this month, but there are more DC Comics uh, coming on the horizon from Kevin. And then you have Kevin's uh, creator own comic, Shadow Service. It's returning from Vault this April. So it sounds to me like Kevin is so busy. Uh, I, what an honor. Uh, to have had him on the show this week. And thank you for listening to Tatooine Sons of Pop Culture Podcast. If you enjoyed this interview, please take a moment to rate and review the show on your podcast app of choice. Seriously, it really does make a difference. Make sure you hit that follow or subscribe button on your app so that you get every episode the moment that it drops. Um, there's, I don't know if we have any Star Wars content to talk about on Tuesday. Oh, yeah, the Obi-Wan Kenobi trailer and all of those images. We're going to talk about that, and I'm sure we'll find some – I mean, Superman and Lois, and and I, if I can maybe get BB-8 to talk about something other than Batman, we'll have that as well. Um, of course, um, make sure you follow the show on that app again, like we talked about, so that you don't miss an episode. While you're at it, follow us on Facebook and on Twitter and share this episode with somebody else. That is how you help the show grow. Uh, that's going to do it for this episode. There's only one thing left to – to say. May the force be with you always. This party's over. I like that Wookiee. Don't get technical with me. Join, please. Yep, yep.